Welcome to part two of my four part series of cycling the length of New Zealand. In part one, I actually cycled from Cape Reinga, which is on the northernmost point of New Zealand, down towards Auckland, towards Matamata, where the famous Hobbit village is, and then I made my way through the Piora National Forest to arrive at the Taronga Rio National Park. And in part two, I'm going to be discussing going what it's like going from the Taronga Rio National Park in the center of the North Island, going all the way down to Wellington, which is on the southernmost tip of the North Island. And then in part three and four, we'll be discussing all to do with the South Island of New Zealand. So I'll start off with the story itself. And then after that, I'm going to be discussing some basic guidelines or some tips and tricks for if you want to go and do a bicycle tour or bikepacking adventure in New Zealand. So just to set the time of year, it was in January 2018, which is at the height of the summer season of New Zealand, I arrived at the Taronga Rio National Park, which is where the famous Mount Doom or Mount Ruapeo stands. And at this point, I actually stayed at Ivan's Bistro, which is a little bar in a small town called National Park. And I had some work there for a few days, I believe. And I was really grateful to stay there and work there to, you know, afford to do more of my travels. And then after that, I left the Taronga Rio National Park. I followed the main highway and I arrived at a old bike trail, which is, which used to be like a railway track because there's a lot of like rail to trail conversions that they've done in New Zealand. I'll leave a link down below for a map of all of the cycle trails that you can go and have a look at or try to follow in New Zealand. But the one I went on very briefly was called the Old Coach Road. And it's not far from Okanui. I believe I might be pronouncing that wrong, but anyway, I'm trying. And uh, from there, I went towards the, there isn't really a name for it. I just went straight into the countryside. I didn't have a couch server to stay with. I just went straight into the middle of the countryside and I arrived at um, this junction and I I was really kind of lost. I was, I was basically door knocking at this point for the night and I door knocked and I found a sheep farmer or a shearer that would let me stay for the night, which I was really grateful for. And I had a chat about like what the shearing is like because I thought about doing that as a job actually. And then I figured out it wouldn't really be for me. Anyway, I was really grateful and I continued down this like gravel road, this metal road. Metal roads are gravel roads in New Zealand or unsealed roads. And I tried to avoid the main highway four and the main highway one. And then I eventually arrived not far from the town of Hunterville. And I didn't actually go into Hunterville, but I tried to follow more of those countryside roads. They were all sealed. And I actually bumped into a cyclist, which was funny on that day. And I had a chat with him. And I eventually arrived at someone's house, which he was going to visit. And I stayed for tea and we, you know, it was, it was really a sweet day, actually. I was really surprised and I probably could have even stayed the night there, but I wanted to continue to try, you know, making some more miles heading towards Palmerston North. And I went back on Highway 1 very briefly. I took some of those country roads again, but this is when the traffic started to increase most of the roads around Palmerston North, I would say, are not very cycle friendly, in my opinion, because there's just a lot of traffic around there. And I tried to take a lot of uh, the backcountry roads and it was much more enjoyable that way. I stayed at Fielding and I was very grateful because I was just putting up my tent on someone's lawn and they, they weren't actually there, but they told me via warm showers that I could pitch my tent up for the night. And I was very grateful because I was really tired on that day. And then I went towards Palmerston North. I stayed with the host briefly there. I really had to do like some washing. I was absolutely filthy. I was really grateful that they were able to host me. And then I went towards the next day. Uh, I was climbing over the Tararua Range. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I have to admit that when I was climbing over the Tararua Range, I was not so happy because there was a lot of traffic going on that road. It was supposed to be a nice backcountry road, but all of the traffic which was supposed to go through the Manawatu Gorge, which is Highway 3, was supposed to go through there. And it was shut because of lots of landslides. And I think even two years later, I looked at the traffic and I think the road is still closed, which is kind of crazy. 
So all the traffic goes on this tiny country road, and it's just something to keep in mind when you're climbing through there. And it is on the official route of Tour of Aotearoa. And the Tour of Aotearoa was this bike trail that I was following, which goes from top to bottom of New Zealand. It's a really good route to follow. I do highly recommend it. And actually, there's a whole book about it if you really want to go into depth about the history and the details of the route. I just followed the GPX file and loaded it on my phone. And Aotearoa, fun fact, in case you didn't know, means land of the long white fluffy cloud. Aotearoa is the original Maori name of New Zealand. So after climbing over this pass, I then went back down and I arrived on the main road of Highway 2. And then I continued to take the country roads towards Masterton. And this country road I was really happy with because there was hardly any traffic. It was basically just like farmers and occasional tourists. And I even saw many other cyclists taking this route. And it was lovely. I really enjoyed it. They're very friendly. That's one of the things I like about New Zealand. You know, they'll ask you for directions or they'll say, do you need directions or can I go and get some water? And people let me into their homes. Um, they let me camp on their property, let me into their homes and sleep. I'm not saying that people should uh, overuse that. What I'm saying is that you should definitely give that back in return. Because when, you, when someone's being like that, it, it makes you think like, wow. Maybe I should be, uh, you know, being like this. Because if everyone was like this, then we wouldn't be all in fear about this crap. And then I arrived at Masterton, which was where I would stay with a warm shower host. Warm showers is a hosting platform for touring cyclists. And I highly recommend having a look at it. It's really, really cool. And I stayed there in this old kind of characteristic house. It, it was really fascinating because I think it was probably 200 years old, the house maybe. I think that's what the um, host was telling me. And it was really interesting staying there. It felt like I was back in the UK or something. Um, so that was really cool staying there. And then the next day I continued to follow a lot of the country road again, which is a big detour, but it is really beautiful and I highly recommend it. Uh, the main highway there isn't that good to cycle on in my opinion, so I would just take the country roads. And then from Martinborough, I arrived there. But before Martinborough, I bumped into Chris. Chris is a guy who I met further north of Auckland, and we cycled together a little bit up there. And then he was also following the same trail as me, so sometimes we would like bump into each other several times. And it was really lovely catching up with him. He had a completely different bike. The bike had like a new dynamo on it, on the wheel, and like this charging port which we talked about. I think the reason he had to replace his bike was because the wheel on his old one was falling apart, and then he just like had it under warranty so they just replaced the whole bike for him anyway so we arrived at martinborough and i was originally going to stay with a host there but what ended up happening was that chris said why don't we just continue heading towards because there's plenty of daylight to head towards wellington so i was like okay that's fine and then we stayed with the the host just briefly we didn't actually stay overnight we just had like a cup of tea and we talked about the house it was a really interesting house made of cob but something we didn't plan for was that the wind rapidly increased when we were leaving the host. So for some reason we were we were heading towards this uh, rail to trail track, which was uh, called Rimataka Rimataka Trail. And for some reason the wind just rapidly picked up. We we were cycling like if you cycled in a straight line, you could see the bike was just on an angle, and it was it was heavy. I don't know why. I think. Something that to keep in mind with this area is it's sometimes the windiest place in the world because of like the two, I mean, New Zealand's set situated in the middle of the ocean, plus you've got this narrowing point between these two mountain ranges on the South Island and North Island, so all of this wind just funnels through that whole area. But anyway, we arrived at the Rimataka Rail Trail, which was converted from a ra railway track to a bike path, and it was absolutely lovely. It just very gradiently, like the gradients are like maybe six or seven percent, and you just slowly make your way through the mountains. And I think the highest point's only 400 meters above sea level or something. But the weird thing is that when a train was going up there, it was one of the steepest tracks, I think, in the world. I was reading about it because we, we stopped, where we stopped at the summit, there was a plaque and a whole little, like, old railway, like, the old station was up there on the summit. 
and it had a little plaque telling you about the history. And as, as the trains would go down the pass, which was only about like 300 meter descent or something like that, and it was only for about five kilometers, but it burnt through a whole set of brake pads. I, think, I thought that was really crazy. And then it had to be replaced before it went to Wellington. Anyway, so the Rim Attack of Trail Rail Trail is really lovely. It's something I'd highly recommend if you're going through there. It means you don't have to go on the main road and you go through all these lovely tunnels and it's, it's beautiful forests and highly recommend it. It's really lovely. We arrive back in the valley and that's where Upper Hut and Lower Hut, which is like an extension of New Zealand suburbs, is located. And we followed, I convinced Chris to follow a lot of the bike trails there instead of taking the main road. And I thought it was worth it because then Chris and I could have a conversation while we were riding instead of like riding single file along a busy main road. I thought it was really lovely. He was just like trying to adjust to like the speed that we had to go down. Anyway, so we arrived at Lower Hut and then we got to the Wellington Harbour. The Wellington Harbour is lovely. It gives you a really lovely view of all of the mountains and you can see Wellington off to the distance. And Wellington is actually the capital of New Zealand, not Auckland, in case someone didn't really know that, but I, I didn't know that for a long time. And actually, also, weird fact, I think Russell Crowe was born here in Wellington. Anyway, we followed this bike path which went around the harbour and avoided taking the Highway 2, which took us all the way into Wellington, and it was a really lovely bike path. It was a bit loud, but other than that, it was really, really lovely with the scenery. And I arrived in Wellington, and so did Chris. Chris went to go and find a hostel to stay in, I believe. And I went to go and stay with a couch surfer I wrote to a while back. And the couch surfer was really kind, because she had, like, three other people staying there, which were, I think, they were renting a room, as, as far as I remember. And I felt like I didn't want to intrude, but I was really grateful that she was able to host me just for the night or two. And the next day, I went down to the harbour, and I caught the ferry, which is the Blue Bridge uh, ferry, I believe. And I just want to, before I actually talk about the ferry, the whole harbour here is really worth checking out. Wellington's a lovely city. You should de definitely have a look at some of the bar scene and the museum. There's a free museum you can go to in Wellington, and it's really lovely via donation, but you don't, you know, that's up to you. You can donate if you need to or want to. And I just check it out. It's really lovely. Keep in mind that Wellington is one of the windiest cities in the world. And the whole strait there around between the North Island and South Island is one of the, the Cook Strait is one of the windiest places in the world. Just keep that in mind. And the ferry crossing was actually really smooth. We had a lovely sunny day. And the ferry crossing, I want to just give an idea of how much it could cost. I didn't want to take the Inter Islander, which is another ferry crossing, another company that offer the crossing. And the, the reason I went with the Blue Bridge was because bikes go on the on the Blue Bridge ferry for free, which was really cool. I'm not sure why they do that, but I was really grateful that they did that. And the tickets are around 40 to 50 New Zealand dollars. So just keep that in mind. If you convert that into pounds, it's actually really cheap considering that the ferry crossing is incredibly scenic. It's pretty smooth. I would maybe bring some food on you on the ferry because the ferry food is really expensive um, but other than that it was a really beautiful crossing and you get to go through once we were leaving the wellington harbor we would go through the cook strait and then we arrived at the marlborough sounds and the marlborough sounds is just absolutely beautiful it's like it's like mini miniature fjords if that makes any sense and then the ferry arrives at picton and actually at picton i met up with some other cyclists who were on the boat and i had a chat with them and rode through some of the marlborough sounds but that is where I'm going to be cutting off this section of the story and I'll be continuing to talk about that in part three and part four but in this last little bit of the video I want to talk to you about some advice for cycling there some guidelines and what to expect so one of the things with New Zealand is that the weather is very rapidly changing all the time so even in summer you can get four seasons in one day that's kind of like the famous tagline with New Zealand and just keep that in mind that you want to have a rain jacket but also be able to change into shorts in one day uh, also keep in mind that New Zealand's uh, sun is quite strong and you can get easily sunburnt so sun cream or at least wearing you know enough layers to keep your skin out of the sun will really help reduce the amount of uh, sunburn that you're going to get. It's a bit like Australia in that regard with the sun burning your skin. 
I would also recommend to have a mountain bike or a gravel bike if you're touring here in New Zealand because a lot of the roads, if you want to take any of the country roads, are unsealed. They are metal roads, they are gravel roads. I would recommend 35 millimeter tires if you're going on a gravel bike. And if you're on a mountain bike, you're obviously going to have like two inch tires and that is like ideal. I would highly recommend a mountain bike. New Zealand is perfect for mountain biking because you can take trails and you can take the gravel roads. It means you can't really go very fast on a main road, that's the only thing. But I think it's better because you get to see more of the country that way and more of the locals. Also coming back to the weather, even though it was January, height of summer, we had a cyclone come through on the North Island and it was insane. The winds were heavy, the rain was in in intense. So just keep that in mind that like you can't even get big storms throughout summer. I will leave links below for all of the routes and all the trails that you can have a look at for if you want to plan out your own bicycle tour of New Zealand. And if you'd like to have a look at the map of my bicycle touring route, you can have a look at the onegoodroad.com slash map and that will give you the full details of all of the other tours that I've done, including this New Zealand bikepacking adventure. If you have any suggestions for future videos that you'd like to see from the One Good Road, definitely leave the suggestions down in the comments below. But that's pretty much it. I hope you guys enjoyed part two. Have a look for part three coming out soon. And stay subscribed for that. That's it. Hope you guys enjoyed.